perhaps you've heard of an underground indie artist who's been getting a lot of traction lately. Her name is Taylor Swift. After a year of immeasurable success and an unprecedented stretch of glowing media coverage, Taylor Swift is finally starting to receive some blowback, and it appears that the pendulum has finally swung in the opposite direction, as it always does when there is an overwhelming presence of one particular kind of response to a cultural phenomenon. Her meteoric rise to fame has definitely triggered some interesting conversations about various kinds of social issues, things that we haven't really seen Taylor be involved in before. I would say that all of this started this next level, this stratospheric rise into being a per perennially relevant and kind of touching all parts of the culture kind of figure was when Congress brought antitrust hearings against Ticketmaster because of Taylor Swift and all of the Congress people were quoting Taylor Swift lyrics on Capitol Hill and then doing nothing about the subsequent investigation. It's really interesting that Taylor Swift has become a pin the tail on the donkey, if you will, for anyone's you know particular issue that they're having with the way that culture is moving at the moment. And this is partly because we are mediating so many things through Taylor Swift. She really helped revive live music after a long period period of struggle. She has revived physical record sales. She has increased interest in vinyl. She accounted for 2% of the music industry's total profit last year. That's crazy. A single artist accounting for 2% of an entire industry's profits. It is so far beyond music and so far beyond just Taylor Swift the person that a bunch of really weird things have started to happen. And, you know, Swifties doing their whole militant, I'm going to defend Taylor by any means necessary, let me call you every name in the book, let me go to a place of slur immediately when anyone even delivers a mild critique of her. This kind of dogmatic and incessant insistence that Taylor Swift is the greatest artist to have ever lived, period, point blank, no further conversation necessary, has I think fostered and grown a little bit of a resentment in the general public. Believe it or not, not everyone is a Swifty. Not everybody wants the music industry to be the Taylor Swift show all of the time. And I think that that can be a little bit isolating for people. And what you're seeing now is kind of the pendulum swing response. People are lashing out at what Taylor is doing, which is overexposing herself. What I think is interesting at this very critical juncture in her career is that she seems to not really care about being overexposed anymore. We know that being overexposed was something she was very cautious about and careful of. I'm doing some research on Red for a project right now. And I read that Scott Borchetta and Taylor had like long and extensive conversations about this marketing blitz that they did for Red, right? It was something they'd never done before. $15 million, they had a bunch of different partnerships, she was in every store, and the main lesson they learned from that or that they had going into doing this was we understand that sometimes it gets very noisy and then we need to be quiet for a while, as in we need to pull away, we need to disappear for a second and let people miss us. We also know that Taylor was having this consideration in 1989 when Kanye called her in that fateful phone call, she said, I'm this close to overexposure, and she was was completely right about that. And I think now what we are seeing is a shift in her attitude towards caring what other people are saying or thinking about her. And Swifties really need to adjust their mindset to follow suit because there is no point trying to defend her from every mindless stupid critique that you see. And just because she is Taylor Swift and you love her does not mean that she's totally immune from being critiqued. We also are having a huge problem culturally with critical thinking, being able to separate criticism from hate. The idea of hate has become so porous. Hate is using hateful language. It is using hate speech. It is persecuting someone for something they cannot change. Criticism is something different. And being mean is also not the same as delivering hate. But I've seen a lot of people referring to what's going on right now on TikTok as a Taylor Swift hate train. And that's the purpose and the impetus of this video. You guys asked me to speak out about the current Taylor Swift hate train. And I guess my kind of overall thoughts before we get into my point by point breakdown of this is that there is no hate train. This is a natural opposite reaction to her being completely overexposed for the last year. Second of all, people comparing this to 2016 either don't have the context of what happened then or don't understand that what they think happened didn't actually happen and therefore is not going to happen again. And I also want to touch on a few of the popular hate train conversations that are going on lately to see if there's either anything valuable we can take away from them or if we can debunk them very quickly and easily, which let me tell you, the Grammys, I can debunk a lot of that immediately. And I'm going to do that for you right now. But before I get into it, my name is Zach. I'm the Swiftologist and I make thoughtful weekly videos about pop culture. If you are interested in having critical, thoughtful analysis of all the things that animate our day-to-day -day discussions on music, books, art, TV, culture, then this is the place for you. Make sure to subscribe. Over 50% of you that watch my videos aren't subscribed. And that's hurtful to me. So subscribe because I have a lot of fun and interesting stuff coming for you. We have the Torture Poets Department coming up very soon. And if you're interested in this very meticulous, thorough analysis of Taylor Swift, you've got to check out my podcast, Evolution of a Snake. We go year by year through Taylor's career, and we're two longtime fans that have an encyclopedic knowledge of her career and the life and times of Taysies' Christ. So 
make sure to follow along for that if you're interested in more of this kind of thoughtful engagement. First, I want to talk about how it's kind of histrionic to compare what's currently going on to 2016 for a number of reasons. Firstly, we have got to stop pointing to 2016 as the straw man of incredibly bad times for Taylor Swift. What happened in that period of time is an incredibly overblown and revisionist historical detail. The cognitive dissonance between Taylor's perception of what happened, my career is over, I've been canceled, and the reality of her success during that time, reputation being the best selling album of 2017, headlining stadium tour, et cetera, et cetera, canceled where has been pointed out many times by the media, most notably by Sam Lansky in the recent profile of Taylor Swift. And though she was personally devastated, I would never take that away from her. Her experience is valid and emotionally resonant, of course. But the facts of what happened do not align with her personal interpretations of that event, despite the fact that it seemed as though the whole world was raining down upon her and everybody hated her and wanted her to be over the records still sold. The concerts still happened. There was literally not even a pause in the production. So using that as a barometer of something really career-endingly bad happening to Taylor Swift is not a good one. Second of all, at this point, I'm going to say it, Taylor Swift cannot be cancelled. She is simply too big to fail. I'm going to explain why while talking about why it feels like there's a hate train to the Swifties who are frankly new around these parts and haven't experienced this kind of backlash for her before. But this is also interesting for veteran fans of pop culture to think about because we've never seen a pop juggernaut be this successful before. It is a truly unprecedented astronomical level of stardom and there is no historical benchmark. We're all learning how to negotiate it, including Taylor. And also, I would like to return to my point that we need to learn how to differentiate between criticism and hate. Taylor Swift, as a public figure, will continue to elicit weird responses or responses that you don't agree with. Anytime she breathes, moves, or speaks, it's only going to get worse and bigger as she gets bigger and does more stuff. She has shown no signs of slowing down. Discourse and conversation moves on quickly, and you don't need to fall on your sword every time you see something negative about Taylor that hurts your feelings. She is currently overexposed, and a side effect of being overexposed is that people get sick of you. Trust and believe that Taylor Swift knows this more than anyone. She's experienced it before and she's choosing to, even though she's in a vast period of overexposure, capitalize on the moment and blitz the public with more and more Taylor Swift content. It's clear that she's made some sort of internal calculation and has decided that she can handle the repercussions of that. If she can handle the blowback, so can you. Let's start with why she's never going to get cancelled. When I say that Taylor's too big to fail, I'm kind of using a economic theory here as an analogy. So being too big to fail is a theory in banking and finance that asserts that certain corporations, particularly financial institutions, are so large and interconnected that their failure would be disastrous to the greater economic ecosystem and therefore they will be supported by government institutions when they face potential failure. So how does that relate to Taylor? Well, Taylor Swift, the business, is too big to fail. Her success as an artist is now an interconnected web of various institutions, stakeholders, and corporations that rely on her in order to remain successful in their own right, lest the whole music industry collapse. Think about it. Her impact on the local G GDP of everywhere she visits, the sheer amount of people that are involved in her own operation, from marketing to logistics to security to merchandise to personnel to everybody that works at the label that supports her, the touring partners, the people that work in the venues that she tours. And I repeat, she accounted for 2% of the profit in the whole industry and was named the most powerful person in the industry above all the label head executives by billboard. Streaming companies also would literally collapse if there was a mass cancellation of Taylor Swift. They need her. Everybody needs her in order to succeed. Taylor Swift suddenly ceasing to exist as a product would be like Facebook or Meta suddenly ceasing to exist as a social media platform. No one's ever going to let that happen because the impact that it would have on all the other social media platforms would tank everything immediately. The music industry, record labels, and more traditional music services are grappling with diminishing returns and trying to get to grips with technology they don't understand that is affecting their ability to make money. It would be very short-sighted of anyone with actual power to cancel Taylor Swift. And I think this is the piece that people don't remember when we talk about cancellations and canceling. Cancellation is not Taylor Swift is over party trending on Twitter. Cancellation is kind of like what's happening to Kanye West right now. He's someone that's really been canceled. Venues will not book him to do his tour live. Labels won't work with him to distribute his music. He's lost all of his commercial partners. People don't want to work with him or sponsor his work. He is literally being deprived of the source money money that facilitates him to keep creating music. That's not going to happen to Taylor Swift, first of all, I mean, in the Kanye West case, because she's not a bigot. But second of all, because there are too many institutions that are invested in her success. So a couple hundred thousand, even a couple million people tweeting that they hate her on Twitter is not going to have any measurable impact on her career. It might make her a little bit unpopular for a short period of time, but it's not going to make her go away. And that fear that Swifties have is 
deranged. And this is why 2016 Part 2, Taylor Swift Observer Party, the re-up, is not a reasonable proposition, nor was it even especially bad to begin with when it first happened. The reality of the matter is she is beloved. That is the reality, period. There's an element of social media here that needs to be unpacked and discussed. What your algorithm shows to you is curated by the platform that you're using to get your maximum engagement. And social platforms get most of their engagement from making you angry. So they deliberately show you content that you don't like so that you will interact with it and stay on the platform longer. The stuff that you're seeing on your TikTok algorithm, keep in mind, is like customized to you. And even though there might be 500,000 likes, a million likes on that, you need to think at scale. Taylor Swift's TikToks themselves get 37 million views, okay? If a TikTok with 1 million views is going viral from a random person sitting in their kitchen complaining about how Taylor's being mean to Lana Del Rey, that has zero measurable impact on Taylor Swift. And plus, social media content is ephemeral. People will move on. Storms blow over. People will move on to things in five minutes, in a week in whatever. So just relax when you see stuff on the internet that is mean about Taylor Swift. You need to remember all of the positive stuff that you see as well, which is definitely counterbalancing the Taylor Swift operation. We've got sold out shows for the rest of the year. You walk up to 10 people on the street, eight out of 10 can name 10 Taylor Swift songs off the top of their head and probably really like her. Let's talk about the recent catalyst for discussions on Taylor Swift's overexposure, which was the 2024 Grammys. The 2024 Grammys were the Taylor Swift show, and this mostly played out on social media, where minute moments of the evening, her interactions with Boy Genius backstage when she didn't know she was being filmed. Sidebar, she definitely knew she was being filmed. When she was posing with them for pictures, dragging lines. Del Rey around on stage, the way she didn't acknowledge Celine in her acceptance speech. These small interactions and these minute moments taken out of context were blown up, magnified, and spread around with various negative interpretations of her. Of course, there's a little bit of confirmation bias. If you think that Taylor's a bully, then you're going to say that her bringing Lana Del Rey up on stage after she didn't win album of the year and was in fact Taylor's competition is her being mean. And if you think that Taylor Swift doesn't respect the artist that came before her or has no respect for the industry, then of course you're going to view what happened between her and Celine in a 20 second exchange was Taylor being deliberately disrespectful. Taylor using the Grammys as her personal platform is well and truly okay with me. I'm a Swifty, but I can understand the visible frustration in the audience that we saw from her peers. And I think their reaction mirrors what I've started to call Taylor fatigue over the last few months. Taylor's astronomical success over the last year is truly remarkable, but success has become so synonymous with anything Taylor does from the smallest thing, like randomly releasing all of the girls you loved before on Spotify and having it do huge numbers on streaming to announcing a brand new album at the Grammys, that it becomes hard to see her accomplishments for what they really are, which is genuine, authentic success from someone who is making good work. Taylor winning over and over again and being gleefully surprised every single time harkens back to a very old critique of Taylor Swift as a public figure. And this is a trope of Taylor Swift that we all have in the back of our minds somewhere because this discourse went on for a very, very long time at the beginning of her career. This feigned surprise, this shock and humility, this idea that she is being fake. How can you not expect to win at this stage in your career? But you know, that's the most uncharitable interpretation of her actions. Taylor is a hopelessly earnest and positive person. And I think that she is genuinely jazzed to receive every award that she does. And that's just kind of part of her personality. But that's all kind of besides the point. What Taylor did at the Grammys actually did kind of rub people the wrong way for a valid reason. The Grammys are a show of peer excellence where you are recognized among your peer for the accomplishments that you've made as an artist. It's not like the VMAs or the BBMAs where the accolades are fan voted and really are only secondary to the spectrum spectacle or the performance of the evening. What Taylor did in that moment was take a moment where she was supposed to address her peers and talk about her writing process. I'm talking specifically about when she won for Pop Vocal Album of the Year, and she was supposed to speak eloquently about her art, but instead she chose to use it as a personal springboard for a new project. Did you see any other artists doing that that evening? Again, I am excited by this. I think it's fun for me. I love to get a new Taylor Swift album. I was live on Twitch freaking out. But how would I feel if I was an artist sitting in that audience, an artist who had worked so hard to get my chance to shine and be celebrated by my peers as well? Victoria Monet, SZA, Miley Cyrus, they were all having extraordinary and historic nights in their own right, but none of them were having a night as extraordinary as Taylor Swift, announcing her new album and thus monopolizing all the shine in the room. Immediately after she announced that, the entire headlines were guaranteed to be all about Taylor Swift the next day. As a peer, you can't help but feel like, well, damn, not only is her success so far 
far out of my reach, it kind of dulls the success that I do have, that I worked really hard for in comparison. People have a right to find this annoying. It's perfectly fine and valid to have a critique of Taylor Swift. And that's what's happened, but it, that is being perceived by the Swifties as a hate train. I do want to talk about the Celine Dion snub, though. That, to me, really was not a snub. I think that Taylor was actually genuinely, for once in her life, truly surprised to have won Album of the Year for the fourth time. A pretty incredible accomplishment. She said she didn't prepare a speech, so I'm sure she had all that in her mind. Damn, I'm going to be on TV. I don't know what I'm going to say. She walks up to the stage. She's kind of trying to make sure that all of her people are there that she wants to thank, and then she gets the award from Celine and starts to make her speech. A lot of people were saying that Miley Cyrus had thanked Mariah Carey very profusely, and so Taylor Swift should have done the same, but it's apple to oranges. There are different artists, and this was a different kind of accomplishment. Miley was winning her second Grammy ever. Taylor was literally making history. There was a lot more pressure on her shoulders. And also, you know what? I actually didn't know that Celine Dion was suffering from stiff person syndrome. Maybe Taylor Swift also didn't know that and only found out after the fact. But either way, I don't think this was an intentional slight at all. But again, when you are this big, when you become the mirror from which everybody wants to project their nonsense onto, your intentions don't really matter because your actions will just be divorced from their context and analyzed mercilessly by people who really aren't looking at it charitably or with good faith. Let's talk about Taylor's supernova burn. What we are witnessing currently is new. As I said, there is no precedent for a pop star being this famous, this disgust, this omnipresent, this all over the place. This is both within and out of her control. That is a very important thing to remember because Swifties do like to abdicate Taylor from any sense of responsibility for any of the situations that she finds herself in. This is a side note for another video, but I've always wanted to talk about how different fan bases kind of take on the characteristics of their fave. And one of Taylor Swift's main characteristics as a narrative is that she's the underdog and she often falls into, you know, a victim narrative. And Swifties love to play the victim on behalf of Taylor. No one forced Taylor to blitz mainstream media. She could have just gone on tour and not dropped any re-recordings and ridden off of that goodwill. But no, she decided to do the two re-recordings. She did the Time Person of the Year interview. She announced a brand new album and she introduced herself on a different world stage to the NFL via the Super Bowl. Believe it or not, just one of those achievements could have carved out a respectable amount of goodwill for Taylor with kind of minimal blowback for years to come. Take the way that Taylor's being perceived now and compare it to the way she was received during the first leg of her re-recordings when she was really focusing on one accomplishment and one accolade at a time. The press coverage of Red Taylor's version and All Too Well 10 was extremely glowing, just as glowing as what we've had in the last year. And the public sentiment was at an all-time high. People were genuinely very intrigued by the Taylor's version project and they were excited to see Taylor reclaiming her work. There were no weird right-wing conspiracy theories about the story she told on the vault tracks or op-eds written in the New York Times about her sexuality. So where did it all go wrong in 2023? Well, Taylor just wouldn't stop going. She acts as a cultural avatar, meaning that her persona and her actions are often seen as emblematic of larger societal trends, issues, and conversations, whether or not those are the intentions behind whatever it is she's doing. Because of her widespread recognition and influence, Taylor becomes this focal point through which various cultural and social debates are mediated. This role amplifies the significance in her every action, whether it's her fashion, her public statements, the themes of her music, turning everything that she does into content, you know, fodder for public discourse and analysis. Taylor directly encourages this behavior as well, which is why there's a little bit of a culpability in people overstepping and overreaching and projecting and having all these insane theories. You know, the Easter egging of it all, the lore building, encouraging people to mine songs for clues and details, it does have the kind of effect of making people think that they are entitled to her story and they are entitled to make their own interpretations of her story and even divorce it from the context of her entirely and create conspiracy theories. Putting the conspiracy theories aside, there are definitely a lot of examples of celebrities being used as cultural avatars. We do this all the time in pop culture. We used Meghan Markle, for example, to talk about the racist history of the monarchy and also discuss how it's kind of impossible to reform an institution as rotten as that. One thing that I thought was very interesting that came up, I think, maybe last year was Sydney Sweeney when she was kind of at the rise of becoming this mega star after Euphoria when she's booking some bigger film roles. She talked about how she found it very destabilizing to be an actress of her caliber. And you know, from the outside looking in, you look at Sydney Sweeney and you think she's so successful, she's so famous, she's so rich, but she said that she has to do a lot of endorsement deals and she has to take on as many parts as she can. She can't afford to be as selective as her counterparts because she doesn't have a robust safety net to land back on because, you know, being 
being in the industry requires that you give 20% of everything you make to your manager, then you give more to your agent. There are a lot of different intricacies to working in the entertainment industry than we see on face value. So Sydney Sweeney kind of breaking the illusion of, you know, the glamorous, effortless, successful movie star and saying that she needs to work was very confusing for people because it rubbed people the wrong way that it seemed like she was complaining about getting to do this job after so many people want it. But I think it also took people by surprise. So that is another example of how we can use celebrities as avatars to have interesting conversations about broader sociocultural issues. And of course, Taylor Swift is no stranger to being used as an avatar for a sociocultural issue. I would say that one of the most interesting conversations that we've been having about Taylor Swift, and yes, this is mildly critical, is about what is the responsibility of a billionaire? How can a billionaire redistribute their wealth? Should they? Should billionaires be allowed to pollute the climate at you know magnificent rates? This is an interesting and worthwhile conversation to have, and Taylor Swift is kind of our conduit to get into that discussion. It's not necessarily a personal attack against her, but you know, stand culture kind of prevents any of these conversations from happening, specifically around Taylor Swift, because there's a victim complex. So because of Taylor's role as the cultural avatar, her behavior, whether it's at an award show like the Grammys or in her music videos or in her social media presence, her behavior becomes frequently dissected for deeper meanings and symbolic interpretations. Again, she encourages this. But you know, she's only really asking us to apply that to her music. It has started to be applied to her interactions with her celebrities, her responses to social issues, and even her silence in certain contexts become loaded with a potential significance. This level of analysis often leads to over-interpretation, where even innocuous actions are seen as deliberate statements or stances. That's basically what Gaylorism is built off of. But another example of this is the Celine Dion snub. Taylor, like, forgetting to hug Celine in a moment of high stress was her snubbing her. Taylor bringing Lana Del Rey on stage despite being a collaborator and her friend was her being a bully and rubbing her success in her face. And this is all amplified by the modern media landscape, which is characterized by the omnipresence of social media. This contributes to the magnification of Taylor's actions for sure. Everything that she does is picked apart, becomes a trending topic. It gets dissected in real time and not just by the fans. I think because the Taylor Swift cottage industry has become so successful, reporters, critics, brands, observers from all different arenas that really would not be commenting on the goings on of Tate McRae's, you know, Instagram comments are suddenly picking up on the most minute details. Catch up and seemingly ranch? Hello? Delusion abound. This instant and widespread discussion definitely amplifies the significance of Taylor's actions far beyond their original context as well. We assign a lot more importance because her actions have become a lot more visible. Another issue that we encounter when it comes to the conspirational side of interpreting Taylor's actions for deeper symbolic meaning is that many fans see themselves in Taylor, and she has always encouraged this as well. Use my stories as lessons to guide your life. When I put these songs out into the world, they're no longer mine, they're yours. But you know, when people use her as a model for navigating their own challenges and experience, that personal connection really elevates the importance of her action and how her actions can influence or reflect back on a fan's own sense of self and personal values. And I think that we can see this kind of line between like a normal parasocial relationship with an artist that you like and a kind of delusional projection where you start to insert yourself as a character into someone else's life is a lot of the fervor around Taylor and Travis, how it definitely scratches this itch of a very heteronormative Caucasian all-American ideal of romance, courtship, and beauty. Literally America's princess with a football star. This is a trope that she herself has explored in her music. It also explains the rise of a certain subsect of queer fans' projections onto Taylor. Their logic goes, since I can see myself in you and I use your music to help me navigate my very specific life and the circumstances that I deal with, that must mean that your life is just like mine and your experiences are the same as mine. Our declining ability to analyze media without self-inserting our own experiences contributes to this completely as well. In general, we're unable to separate from this happened to me with it also happened to you. And we're also unable to separate I don't like this from this is wrong or this is bad. And both of those two things are really impeding our ability to have intelligent cultural conversations about Taylor Swift and other cultural avatars in the media. Now let's talk about the Taylor Swift economy. So when you become so important to the world, both symbolically and literally, there is a certain abstraction of who you are as this cultural avatar. Taylor is not just a pop star anymore. She's not just a young woman who writes about her feelings. The decisions that she makes as a businesswoman have a seismic impact on our culture and the economy. For example, the re-recordings project, which has totally shifted the way that we as a culture and the music industry views the importance of owning your intellectual property, your master recordings. She also raised 
awareness about predatory contracts and kind of vaguely mentioned this when she was figuring out how she was going to respond to having her master's taken away from her. However, the response to this has been, she's launched this project, this Taylor's version effort, and it has been a rip-roaring success, and it has inspired so many different artists to try and take back their work, but the record labels have noticed what Taylor has done, and they are now adjusting their royalty structures and contracts to deliberately make it harder for artists to actually successfully launch a Taylor's version-esque project of their own. And this is actually happening on Taylor's very own record label. Taylor's awareness of the ownership IP problem is very limited to her own world view, as is basically any problem that she speaks on in this world. You might think that she would speak on this at length a little bit more or have a conversation with her own record label about making changes that prevent the artists from reclaiming their work if she really cared about other artists' experience with ownership. But that's not really in the scope of her best interest. There is also that tension between Taylor Swift being, you know, the sensitive, vulnerable artist and also the kind of ruthless, cunning businesswoman. Because Taylor is an avatar and a powerful avatar, not just someone who reflects a conversation, but often drives them with her actions, her actions often intersect with ongoing conversations that we have about society. So gender, power, privilege, and identity. And so her navigation of being a celebrity, of being a creative person in public, of her personal expression, what she chooses to share and not share, all of these things become a mirror reflecting broader cultural dynamics and tensions in our society, which kind of makes Taylor the scapegoat for a lot of this. And this reflection makes her actions a point of reference in discussions about feminism, the entertainment industry's changing dynamics, and the expectations placed on public figures, especially women. And I think everyone's main critique of Taylor that I've seen that is a valid one to contend with and discuss, my personal opinion on this issue is that I don't really care for Taylor to be a politically active person in the world, although I have to say my views on that are slightly shifting as she becomes more and more famous it seems kind of inevitable that she's going to have to take a stance on something at some point how is she going to navigate doing that she doesn't have a good track record of doing it i haven't come to a cogent conclusion on that but i will voice and repeat to you what i have seen to be a main critique that i think is worth discussing which is that taylor uses her voice to advocate or speak on issues and she takes up space in these issues in the room when it benefits her so two things can be true at the same time taylor can be opportunistic about raising awareness or being a responsible public figure, but it's also not really her duty or her job to be Mother Teresa. And Helen Peterson, who is a cultural critic who writes a substack called The Culture Study, explained this beautifully. She relates this to her own experience as a privileged white woman. She says, as a privileged white woman with progressive politics, I understand the frustration. We are generally good at seeing injustice, and we are generally bad at giving up our own sliver of societal power in order to rectify that injustice. What most reliably moves us to act is personal stakes, and the absence of them makes it easy for us to move on from causes that other people have no choice but to engage with every day of their lives. It can feel like white women are only in the fight when the fight is popular, easy, and without significant social or financial risk. And when they do join the fight, they want to be celebrated for it. An immediate and interesting comparison that we could make here is, you know, talking about reproductive rights. Taylor has often talked about feminism and a woman's right to choose in many different contexts, autonomy, agency. And when Roe v. Wade was overturned, she sent out a tweet, I believe, but there was really no active campaigning, no big donations. There was nothing seismic or important changed after that, which I think kind of supports what Anne Helen Peterson is saying here, that there is the opportunity to engage when it benefits you, but when it no longer serves you directly to be talking about an issue, you kind of take a step back. And I think that that is an interesting conversation to have. This is a good example of what being a cultural avatar means. It's not pinning the responsibility for the world's evils on Taylor Swift, but it is discussing how she moves within and navigates these systems of oppression or hierarchy that that are very prevalent and very affecting to large swaths of the population. She also acknowledges how frustrating it is and what a losing battle it is to try and be the good girl in public. It also feels unfair because you can try and do everything you were told to do, work so hard to please so many different demands from so many different people and still not get it right. So circling back to what's going on right now, the cancellation, the hate train, I think what we're currently going through with Taylor is not a cancellation, it's a market correction. So a market correction is a temporary price drop that helps readjust asset prices. Taylor Swift, who has been very visible visible in the public eye may need a similar price adjustment to maintain a healthy level of exposure. This could be like a temporary decrease in public appearances or media coverage just to rebalance her presence and avoid overexposure. But you know, 
I think that Taylor is actually not interested in kind of navigating the intricacies of being overexposed anymore. We know that this was something that really animated her and it was something that she worried about a lot and led to, I would say, a level of hypervigilance and neurotic control of her career that read as being very insincere. We're I'm talking about the 1989 era right now. And her house of cards built upon that kind of anxiety about people getting sick of her, but also having this overwhelming drive and ambition to be the biggest pop star in the world. All of those things kind of came together and fell apart part for a brief period of time. Now, what's interesting to see is that I don't think that she's considering how people are going to respond to the things that she wants to do. She's simply being moved by her internal compass. And I thought it was very beautiful to see in her album of the year acceptance speech, her talking so, so honestly and authentically about how doing the work itself is a reward. Finishing a song, putting the song out, performing a song live, this is all part of the joy that she experiences from being a public figure. And who is anyone to tell her to stop doing that? There are definitely ways, however, that she could participate in that, that sharing, that opening of her artistic self without also isolating or alienating people. For example, like stealing the spotlight and announcing her new album at the Grammys. She said she was going to do it in Tokyo anyway, and it would have had the same impact regardless. So why not is what I'm saying. I also wanted to touch very briefly on the politicization of a supernova, Taylor Swift in this scenario. Due to her fame, her actions and images are also subject to political and ideological projection. So where different groups may interpret or co-opt her stance for their own agendas, and this aspect of her celebrity means that every move of hers is now starting to be politicized, willingly or not, adding layers of public significance and consequence to her persona. Here's a quote from The Economist about an article talking about the right-wing conspiracy theories about Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey, and the NFL and also Joe Biden and her being a psyop. At the astral heights Miss Swift has reached, celebrity can be a form of mass hypnosis or magical thinking. Fans conspire to imbue their idol with powers and significance beyond the merely mortal. Many feel they share a personal connection with a total stranger. A conspiracy theory doesn't have to make sense to you, only to its adherents. Likewise, the cultish devotion of Swifties can seem baffling to the uninitiated. He then goes on to talk about why Taylor Swift is becoming kind of a right-wing bogeyman in the American political landscape right now. In an ultra-polarized outlook, your opponent is not not a rival, but an enemy, and he is always up to something. Political strife spreads into unlikely crannies of life, from beer to sport to music. Politics starts to resemble a contest between conspiracy theories. This ratchet effect mirrors the momentum of conspiracism, which is always moving on to the new, more outlandish speculation, the most ambitious claim to be comprehensive, decoding not this or that murder, but the hidden mechanism of the universe. It may seem odd for Smith Swift to feature in the fantasies of conspiracists, to be the actress starring in their bad dreams, as she might put it, but looked at in this light, it's natural. Her ongoing tour has been blamed for causing inflation in Singapore and an earthquake in Seattle. She is so famous that both the Pentagon and Japanese diplomats have made cringy statements punning on her lyrics. She must be explained. I thought that was very interesting. But again, they fall into the corny trap of weaving a Taylor Swift lyric into their copy. Girls, give it up. Enough. It's embarrassing. And yet, despite all of the conspiracy theories and challenges of being mega famous that I have mentioned to you, she continues to thrive. She's just sold the Eras tour to Disney for $75 million, the film that is, after already making $300 million dollars on the original film plus the billion dollars she made on the tour. She's got sold out shows through the end of this year and I guarantee you there are going to be more shows in 2025. She's already got a record-breaking 11th studio album on the books for this year and two re-recording projects that are sure to be massive in the future. She is not a fragile, vulnerable, delicate, retiring wallflower that you, the Swifties, need to protect and defend every five minutes. In fact, this is the other part of why Taylor Swift is experiencing a hate train. The incessant attacking of anyone who speaks even mildly critical of Taylor only contributes to the two biggest factors that drive Taylor fatigue in the first place, abstracting her and making her seem more important or larger than she is, aka ascribing political significance to her where there is none and making her look stupid, and reading too closely into the symbolism of her actions, allowing people to project basically anything they want onto her, and also reading into the symbolism of other people's actions, applying this Taylor Swift lens to other people in order to silence detractors. And by insisting to detractors, and I'm using that term lightly because to be a Swifty detractor, all you have to do is not say that Midnight's deserves to win album of the year. That was my current experience. By insisting to these detractors that they are wrong and sending them death threats or calling them slurs for saying benign criticisms, you reinforce to people that there is some sort of machine behind Taylor that is actively working to silence dissidents and cover up some real truth that she is trying to unleash upon the world. And this really helps support the PSYOP theory a lot. And it also makes her very alienated from the industry and from other artists. And it makes their fans resentful of her, which encourages 
them to amplify more hate train content because Swifties will let Townsend pack for no good reason at all. Joni Mitchell, 80 year old legend in the music industry, prolific queen of songwriting, known for being a direct inspiration for Taylor Swift's album Red, cited by Taylor Swift multiple times as instrumental to her songwriting career and evolution. The 14 year olds found out because they just joined the fandom yesterday that Joni said Taylor couldn't sing 10 years ago. And you know, this is where we, when we remove the context and we take things completely out of their historic position, this is where it becomes very nonsensical and stupid. So the thing that Joni said about Taylor Swift was there was a rumor that Taylor was going to star in a biopic about Joni Mitchell. Joni Mitchell, back in her day, had a very high operatic soprano voice, a very traditionally musical voice that Taylor doesn't have. And Joni quippingly, jokingly, in a magazine interview said she might have the cheekbones, but she certainly doesn't have the voice. And even though that was a quip, it was also true. Taylor Swift does not have the voice to sing those early Joni Mitchell songs. She just doesn't. Joni Mitchell is an 80-year-old music industry legend, and there are Swifties out here calling her a flop, saying that she doesn't have any streams. And it's this disrespect for the history of music and for the creation of art throughout time that makes Taylor seem fake, that makes the Taylor Swift enterprise seem like an elaborate prank that people are playing on the public. It's no wonder that people resent Taylor using the Grammys as her personal springboard when this is the behavior that her fans use to represent her accordingly. So I hope that was a thorough enough investigation of why Taylor Swift is not over party. And I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on this. And I am so looking forward to the Eras tour. I'm seeing it next month. I'm going to every single show in Singapore and I will be doing live streams on TikTok of the surprise song. So go and follow me there. And I will of course be doing a vlog here for you all to view if you so wish. So I hope that you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Goodbye Swifties.